Good evening. Welcome, everyone. Glad to have you here with us. I would like to begin with a word of prayer. Lord, we're so grateful for this week that you've given us. We're grateful for the Sabbath rest that's coming. And we're, we're also very delighted to be able to talk about nutrition this evening. And so we ask that you'd bless our time together, that you would give us clear minds to understand what is being said. And we ask you'd bless our speaker as he goes through his presentation. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. So I would like to introduce our speaker tonight. His name is Dr. Winston Craig. He, he started out with a PhD in organic chemistry, but he is a nutritionist and a master of public health from Loma Linda University. And he has taught nutrition for decades at Andrews University in Michigan. And so he has much experience in the area. He actually has a great website, if anyone's interested. It's the, you can just jot this down. It's easy to remember, vegetarian-nutrition.info. And he's also written a number of books. One of them, one of them, if I can get my, my hand sorted out here. One of them I have right here, Optimum Health. And there's others as well. These are available at the Adventist Book Center. And so uh, you'll be able to get those. Also, he's doing a book signing on September 28th, so three weeks from yesterday. If you want to stop by the bookstore in the afternoon, he'll be there signing his books. And so he has a lot of experience in this area. He's traveled the world lecturing. He's uh, helped out with a lot of different series and seminars. And we're delighted that he can be with us this evening. He's done lots of research, and we can surely benefit from what he has to tell us. So will you join me in welcoming Dr. Winston Craig? Thank you very much for the introduction. I'm happy to be here and share with you a little bit. I can picture all of you at a mountain spa beside a nice, cool, flowing stream with a glass of pomegranate juice in your hand. And um, I'd be eating a vegan lasagna or pizza. Can you imagine yourself there? Well, optimum health is not always associated with optimal lifestyle. Vegans can get colon cancer. Vegetarians can die of a heart attack. People who drink two liters of water a day and get eight hours sleep a night can get diabetes. People who read their Bible every day and pray can get high blood pressure. So what does it matter how we live? Hmm? Enjoy life to the full. Sooner or later, we're going to die. Well, science tells us otherwise. We could spend the rest of the night sharing with you data to show that those consuming largely or wholly a plant-based diet live longer, have less chronic disease, live more meaningful lives. 
But is that why we live healthfully? To live longer? Better? Healthier? To feel better and enjoy life? What does Paul tell us? We are what? Temples. Temples of God. A temple is where God interfaces with human beings. That's a pretty special place. Very special. So special that some of us want to take good care of our bodies and follow the eight natural remedies and good science. God wants to live in us. We know Matthew 5, let your light so shine that we might glorify God. That's what living healthfully is all about. And it's not so easy to do that if we have a headache or a stomach ache or a backache or some other problem. So that's why we want to take care of our bodies isn't it? And our minds and our social life and all of the other pieces and components that go into a healthy lifestyle. In the book Gospel Workers we read the efficiency of our work depends largely upon what? Our physical condition. We should preserve all our powers in a condition to give the best possible service. Now, I don't need to be telling you that, but I need to remind myself that's the reason for choosing a healthy lifestyle so that we might give, what does it say? The best possible service. That's what our life is all about, service. Service to God. And in the, in the Torah, we read that being obedient to God's commands, God's instructions, ensures both the quality and the quantity of life that he gives so that you may live and prosper, it's quality, and prolong your days. That's the longevity. In Bible, the word for health is shalom. And I, I mention this because it, even though we're talking tonight about nutrition, we can't do it in isolation. Nutrition is embedded in a whole cluster of things and we'll talk more about some of this tomorrow with mental health and, and other things. But the word shalom in scripture talks about the physical, emotional, mental, spiritual well-being. The whole, the wholeness, completeness, tranquility. That's what it's all about the state of mind, the state of your relationships, having life in balance. And this brings us to the, the word that we have in English. We don't have shalom. You know, Shabbat shalom, we say. It's the fullness of the Sabbath blessing for you. We have the word wellness. And we've got in front of us that word wellness. And you, you're familiar with the components that go into that. And nutrition may be at the center of this word, but it's surrounded by equally important things. The, the CDC tells us that we need to exercise every day, we need to get proper sleep every day and eat properly. These are the three legs of the, the tripod of the kitchen stool that healthy life is founded upon. But there are other ingredients. Water, keeping your life in balance, that's the moderation. That's the problem with life today, isn't it? Everything's out of balance. From Washington all the way down to, to my house. Every community it seems to be being shaped by different issues, one side or the other. So the Christian life is walking the straight, having loving relationships. We'll talk about this tomorrow. Very important. Somehow, as Adventists, we've been so focused on diet, we've forgotten that social connectedness is very important for good health. 
proper sleep, sunlight, fresh air, and managing stress. These all go in. You're familiar with the eight natural remedies. This is just a different formulation, but it's the same sort of idea. Now, there was an interesting study. It was published just last month, and it was in Britain looking at um, people who were following the Mediterranean lifestyle. Now, I'm sure if I ask who's heard of the Mediterranean diet, you'd all respond. You all know what that is. The diet that's practiced in Greece and Spain and southern France and Italy along the Mediterranean. Okay? But this is an interesting study because this is outside of the Mediterranean. This is in Britain. Nothing to do with the Mediterranean. So they had adopted the lifestyle into their culture. And what did they find? They found that those who followed it compared to those who practiced little of it had, what does it say, 30% less mortality, risk of all causes of death, 30% less death from cancer, and cardiovascular disease greatly reduced. And it was a dose-response relationship. What does that mean? The more they followed it, the better the protection. It's a good scientific study when you can get dose relationship. That's very important. But there's more to the story. You thought I was going to talk about Mediterranean diet, but it was not just that. This is the fascinating part to me. Is that, you know, we're familiar with that. Whole grains, fruits and vegetables, nuts and seeds, olive oil, etc. Very few animal products. It wasn't only that but they also included exercise and sleep. And you'll notice the last thing listed there, highlighted, socialization with friends and family. Don't forget it. This is perhaps for, for some the missing piece. Mental tranquility and, and health and wholeness and wellness depends upon these other factors, including socialization, social connectedness. So how are Americans doing? Pretty lousy. <laughs> the CDC tells us that only one out of ten American adults eats enough fruits and vegetables. And we need to be eating about five servings a day of vegetables and three or four of fruit. Only one out of ten Americans are doing that. So we have a message to share with our neighbours. So we, we come more close to home and we say, well, there's Mr. Casual. He says, ha, don't get on my back. I'm not worried about all these rules and regulations. It's too many, too many rules, restrictions. After all, we're saved by faith, not by gym workouts and vegan meal plans. The truth is it does matter. Adventist health study from Loma Linda shows that the Adventist who's not overweight and who exercises regularly and who eats a good share of fruits and vegetables is expected to have an extra decade of life. And it's not just ordinary life, it's good life. Who wants to live longer if you're in a wheelchair or hobbling around or lying in a bed? I mean, this is vibrant life, added years, compared to, because everything's always compared to, the Adventist that's overweight and eating a lot of fat and meat and is not exercising. Okay, So it does make a difference. These lifestyle things that we're talking about do add up add up to a decade of life. More time to spend with your grandchildren and great-grandchildren, yes. Okay? Well, there's the other extreme. The casual, Mr. Casual, is, ah, don't bother me. Then there's the, the other extreme where people are so focused on emphasizing health and its importance that um, they follow these practices like checking them off on the, on the calendar, making sure that they've done everything correctly. I call this 
righteousness by fork and spoon or perfection by pedometers looking to see whether they've done their 10,000 steps or 12,000 steps or you know and the whole life is centered around the the frenzy about meeting their, those goals well it's good to have those goals and it's good to follow those practices but let's put it in balance we even have a magazine now called forks and knives that emphasizes a plant-based diet and it's good to read this get ideas my point is let's not let's not go to either either extreme because the christian life is where down the middle the balance all these things in balance we have to juggle them that's the part of life is to keep all these ingredients in balance and it's it's a daily effort to develop the habits so that they become second nature to us well that's my 15 minute introduction i can stop preaching now i can start teaching where you came here tonight not to hear about my philosophy of life but to hear about the anti-inflammatory diet and so we'll get cranked up into this how do we achieve this wonderful diet and first of all um, we want to talk about what inflammation is we're all familiar with it when we cut ourselves or bruise ourselves inflammation occurs the body responds the immune system kicks in and cells are cytokines proteins and other things are sent to the site the police squad the ambulance the fire brigade they go to take care of it that's good we want that inflammatory response but the issue comes about when it gets out of whack it's not in balance and when it overreacts you know we have people that have immune problems because their immune system overreacts or we have what's called chronic inflammation where the inflammation lasts and lasts and lasts and what's the big deal the big deal that we've discovered now is this inflammatory response the chronic one that lasts and lasts you know like the ever ready battery just goes on and on this is what undergirds all of the chronic diseases that we're fighting with today heart disease cancer diabetes stroke they all have an undergirding inflammatory response which is aggravating tissues and is causing changes because inflammation is like an emergency what would it be like if you had ambulances and fire brigades and police cars roaring down here all during church every minute you'd be driven crazy well that's what it's like with inflammation in the body it, it it doesn't handle what's only for an emergency situation so fortunately what we eat can push us into inflammatory or can be fighting the pathways that lead to there are different processes and plant foods but not animal foods plant foods have compounds that are provided and most of these are what we call phytochemicals now you might shudder at the word chemical and think you know chemicals are not good but these are plant chemicals in our food that the creator put there for our protection are there in the plant to protect the plant against solar radiation insect attack etc but when we eat them they provide protection and so pigments the more pigments we eat the better the more rich the reds and the greens and the yellows and the purples the better because these are the protective antioxidants that have anti-inflammatory activity so the colored fruits and vegetables are the best anti-inflammatory defense you can have berries are, are very good so color means protection okay that's a good message to take home tonight color protects you so the outer leaves of the vegetables that are face solar radiation they have more of these protective than the inner heart that might be crisp and maybe your favorite but those straggly old outer leaves actually have more of the anti-inflammatory the skins of fruits 
are a higher level than the pulp because you en eat, end up eating more pulp so you're going to get a lot from eating the pulp so it's not a matter of just eating the skins but my, a lot of the fruits we eat like apples and pears the flesh is white whereas things like peaches and oranges there's color inside and so that flesh inside has those protective pigments and then the pellicle or the skin around peanuts and walnuts and almonds that's loaded with phytochemicals so if you blanch the nut, you're, you're tossing away all those phytochemicals. The seed coat in legumes like black beans and red kidney beans and so on. Those pigments are also have anti-inflammatory activity. Using extra virgin oil, which has this dark green yellow colour. Don't ever buy pure olive oil. It's not pure. That word is a trick. It's olive oil that's been purified and then removed of all the good things and then they add back a little bit of the virgin to give it some color so that you don't think you know you're buying kerosene or something because it's transparent so always look for the label extra virgin okay and then grains of course you want the whole grains because it's the outer layer where all the anti-inflammatory compounds exist so that just mention the extra virgin oil you know tyrosol and and um, other compounds that are there, polyphenolics, these, these are anti-inflammatory and what have I connected anti-inflammatory compounds with? Protection against stroke, heart disease, cancer, diabetes, etc. The chronic diseases, okay? So that's what we see. Olive oil protects us. Okay, now in addition to the coloured pigments, another thing that plant foods helps to protect us with is the fiber where do you find fiber well it's in whole foods it's not going to be in apple juice but it's in the apple it's going to have little in apple sauce because it's disrupted it's not going to have the same effect so eating the whole food with the fiber and of course the fibrous material in in meat it is not the fiber we're talking about so it's a plant food property and this um, the the fiber is broken down is broken down to what we call short chain fatty acids SCFA and these are anti-inflammatory so the the microflora in the gut make they metabolize these compounds that impact the immune system that make anti-inflammatory compounds or influence these pathways that are protective okay so how do we get these good microbes in our gut by eating plant foods that are high in fiber white bread white rice white sugar forget it okay we're talking about whole grain products and eating the whole vegetable the whole fruit and so forth okay so we give a couple of examples here butyrate Unpropionate, these are um, uh, butyrate inhibits pro-inflammatory cytokines which are small proteins and propionate is another small metabolite it suppresses the pro-inflammatory um, production of this, this compound which is involved with inflammatory responses. So dietary fiber, wonderful, impacts the microflora the microflora control your health you probably knew that that there's more cells in your gut than there are in the rest of the body so taking good care of your of the microflora in your gut is of utmost importance animal foods on the other hand are, are a downer they contain these three substances, choline, carnitine and betaine, which make um, trimethylamine, TMA, and that's metabolized in the body to the oxide. And this is a nasty critter. You can't see it in the diagram, it's too small. But this compound mediates the, the development of cancer and diabetes and all the bad things. And so we have on one hand plant fiber changing the flora to produce metabolites that protect us and animal products that are metabolized that produce pro 
inflammatory markers. So that's the choice that one has. So Hippocrates, a long time ago, 2,500 years ago, he made the statement, let food be your medicine. He didn't realise how true that was. But that's the situation we find ourselves in today with all the new research, the science coming out. You know, some people are a little bit sceptical of science, but science explains to us things that we can follow and enjoy better health. Science and God's handiwork are one and the same thing. It's the interpretation that can be questionable and people who don't interpret science correctly can come to the wrong conclusions. But we should trust good science, and I say good science. So just coming to some of the foods, just to highlight and emphasize, underline, underscore to you. Berries, the blues, the purples, the reds, these are all rich in flavonoids and in particular what's called anthocyanins. You may see this in some of the magazines and, and the lady magazines that you see in the, in the counter in Weimart and other places. Anthocyanins are your friends. These are some of the most potent antioxidant, anti-inflammatory compounds in our food. So we should include these every day in our diet, at least one of them. Strawberry, a blueberry, a grape, a plum, a cherry. It's not just the berries because plums and cherries aren't berries, but they also have this same pigment. Finnish study looking at diabetes, um, if you look, the red highlights um, statistical significance. If you're not familiar with that, we've kind of highlighted these numbers are less than 0.05 and you see that fruits and vegetables uh, really don't have outstanding um, protection against diabetes. There is protection, but it's not as clear marked and s as significant as the berries. You see there the third line berries in red. The red is to highlight that this is significant. Berries protect against the development of diabetes because of the anthocyanins. It's the pigments. I'm sorry if you get bored, but we just repeat it over and over again. Okay? You know, the, the, these slogans, it's the, it's the pigments, stupid. You know those slogans they have? It's the economy, stupid, whatever slogans they have around. Well, it's, it's the pigments. And I, I don't want to say stupid because that's a bad word, but okay. It's the pigments, okay. So they're moving to grapes. The grape juice, the purple grape juice, again has those anthocyanins, the pigments, and the flavonoids, these polyphenolics. Both of them fall into the polyphenolics. Strong antioxidants. And these, these protect against chronic diseases. In this case, in this paper, blood clots. In another paper, they protect... Um, against uh, blood lipids. They lower blood lipids and they also protect against the oxidation of LDL, which, if you don't know, that is the key factor in development of atherosclerosis. The cholesterol in the LDL particle gets oxidized and that triggers the plaque formation in the arteries. So grape juice protects against that. Okay, another study shows that it increases nitric oxide, which regulates vasodilation, the relaxation of the blood vessels. So what is that good for? The amelioration of high blood pressure and prevention of stroke. It's also shown to delay memory decline. And that's a good one, I'll take that. And then another study shows, of course, this, this um, flavonoid class still been as a subclass of flavonoids, resveratrol. You've probably heard that word. You know, the wine industry, they like to, they like to blow their trumpet. <laughs> Our wine's got resveratrol and it does this and this and this. Well, where did it come from? Where did the wine get it from? <laughs> it got it from the, the grapes and the grape juice and, of course, the skins particularly. And so this compound has anti-inflammatory action and protects against a number of 
different cancers. Pomegranates. And we had you sitting by a, a stream back there in that mountain spa, remember? Where we started off. The pomegranate um, is also a very good fruit and it has many antioxidant, anti-inflammatory compounds and this study showed that it inhibited highly aggressive prostate cancer. So um, some believe this was the fruit that was on the tree of life, not an apple. An apple doesn't grow in the Middle East, but that's another story. We won't get into that controversy. Cherries, okay, cherries also can inhibit the development of another inflammatory marker, this one called CRP, called C-reactive protein. And when you can diminish that, that's a good anti-inflammatory. So the cherries help, help in that respect. Flavonoids, which are all through the fruit and vegetable kingdom, they are very protective against inhibiting um, CRP. Okay, and then we go to citrus. You know, we, we just go through all the fruits. Um, it might get boring, but for me, this is the center of my life, eating fruits. I can't think of anything better. So many good ones, from bananas to mangoes to pomegranates. So citrus, okay, it's full of anti-inflammatory flavonoids that in, um, inhibit these uh, inflammatory mediators. And the results of this, you don't think of this, but there are, you ready? over 120 phytochemicals in an orange. All of them have anti-cancer activity to some degree. Limonoids, carotenoids, flavonoids, glucarates, terpenoids, all together, 120. So like other fruits, they provide protection. You can see here they provide protection against a clot against high blood pressure and against LDL oxidation, which is the atherosclerotic process. Okay, and it's not just the fruits, the vegetables. The vegetables actually do a better job. The broccoli and the other cruciferous, you know the cruciferous? Cabbage, Brussels sprouts, cauliflower, arugula. Okay, these are all belong to the cruciferous. These contain the phytochemical isothiocyanate. Okay, and these interfere with inflammatory pathways and so protect us. In this study, it's just this one study, it was looking at prostate, but you could be looking at other cancers. Okay. Tomatoes. This was from Loma Linda, Adventist Health Study. Okay, eating, eating less than one so that's the blue bar, okay, we set that at one. Eating almost daily tomatoes, what do you notice? That's the red bar. More than five servings a week, that's like almost one a day. Um, if you have, have them in the garden like we do, you'd nibble on them maybe twice a day for breakfast and for lunch. But um, you'll notice the decrease in prostate cancer, 40%. That red line has come down to 0.6, that's 40%. Well, it's not only tomatoes. If you have good eyesight, you can read at the very bottom that the reason for it is this red pigment, a carotenoid called lycopene. Now, some of these names may be new to you. Some of them you may have read in magazines. The redness in tomatoes, it's the lycopene. And there are other red foods which have also this lycopene. You might not like uh, tomatoes like I do. Maybe you want to eat guava, watermelon, papaya, or pink grapefruit. Take your pick. Any one of them will supply you with lycopene. Anti-inflammatory, okay? Protect you against that myriad of chronic diseases that we have been mentioning. And then we have the, what's called the Apiaceae family, this family of um, plant foods, also called the carrot family. It contains celery and parsley and dill 
and cilantro and these have a unique phytochemical which you don't find very commonly throughout the whole plant kingdom they're called polyacetylenes and these um, also have anti-inflammatory properties so you kind of get the picture I hope that if you eat lots of fruits and vegetables you're on the pathway to getting great anti-inflammatory protection this paper that's mentioned reference there um, fal caranol compound isolated from carrots was shown to delay the growth of cancer in the colon so we get protection in different parts of the body from eating different uh, foods and then we come to soy uh, some in the community kind of shudder when you mention the three letter word it's kind of synonymous with ah you don't take soy it's kind of dangerous stuff and it turns a man into a woman and a baby into a monster and causes breast cancer and on and on the story goes but none of those stories are really true and I could give you 40 different papers to show that there's, there's no evidence. Soy is a unique bean in that it contains isoflavonoids and these isoflavones or isoflavonoids, genistein, diadsein and others have strong anti-inflammatory effects and so guess what? They protect against heart disease, they lower cholesterol and they protect against breast cancer and prostate cancer. And a large study in China amongst Chinese women, they stratified them of those who ate tofu and those other soy products and those who ate little. So it was graded most down to least. And what did they find? These were women who'd had breast cancer. They followed them for two, three years and they found that the recurrence of breast cancer was not any different in the, in, in, in the ones who were using soy than those who were not. So that, and if you look at other papers, there's no evidence that soy causes breast cancer. Well, people say, but if you look at the structure of these isoflavones, they look like estrogen, and we know estrogen stimulates mammary tissue to, to go cancerous. Well, they look a little bit alike but they behave differently and I don't have time to go into all the chemistry but they, they behave differently and in fact they act like estrogen in the bone and they're an anti-estrogen in the breast and that's good news, good news, check it off both ways. Estrogen makes bones more dense, retain the minerals and uh, anti-estrogen means it protects against cancer. So rather than all these stories that tell you that soy is bad, it's actually good, good, good. Okay? And here's a study with Asian American women because regular American women, you may be different, but most American women don't eat a lot of soy, so they have to go to the Asian American women. And you see there's those who are eating little to, to no uh, tofu, that's the green bar at the top. The middle bar are those who are eating tofu fairly regularly, um, almost daily, more than four times a week. And what do you notice? The risk of breast cancer has shortened, has diminished by, it's at 0.7, so that's 30% reduction. And if they had been eating, um, if they were not US born, that's the bottom line, what do you notice then? Isn't it an advantage to be a non-American? <laughs> Looks like it does here. And, and what is the reason for that? Because these Asians were outside of America, they were back in the Philippines or in Japan or in Indonesia and growing up as adolescents, what were they eating? Soy. And so they've shown that if adolescents eat soy, as an adult, they are more protected than women who started eating soy later in life. So that period of 
of um, adolescence seems to be important when there are changes that are happening. Okay? So th this to me validates the use of soy products, soy milk, soy yogurt, tofu, whatever soy product you want to use that protects against breast cancer. Now this is a composite picture I put together because I wanted to shorten things down a little bit, but avocados, apples, mangoes, and citrus. And if you can see, you probably can't from way back there, but I've given the scientific reference for each of these. And at the top of the picture, I've listed the phytochemicals that have anti-inflammatory action. So this is not hocus pocus. This is not guesswork. This is documented. These compounds have been isolated and tested and have been shown in cell cultures to interfere with, and in some cases, in clinical cases, have interfere with pathways that are involved with inflammation. So all of these foods are valuable. They all provide protection for us. And here's just a, an abbreviated list of some of the phytochemical on the left are the families. They're not the names of them. These are just the families, like carotenoids. There's hundreds of carotenoids. These are the coloured pigments in peaches and mangoes and pineapple and so on. Okay? And on the right-hand side, it lists the foods that have a high concentration of these. And what do you notice? This, this is a question. What's the magic bullet? Is there a magic bullet? Or shall I say there is no magic bullet? Yeah, there's no magic bullet because things are scattered everywhere. So what's the key in our eating? Oh, you mean you came out tonight just to hear what you learned in home economics or nutrition 101 at college? That good nutrition is variety. That's a very simple message, but that's the way it is because these protective compounds, phytochemicals that are anti-inflammatory is scattered all over the place. And the interesting thing is, oh, I'm sorry, I thought the next one was, the interesting thing is that there's like 25 different mechanisms. I thought I had that up, but I've deleted that slide because it's very biochemical and it might cause your head to swim a bit. But there are different pathways that these compounds interfere with or promote or block in, in their anti-inflammatory effect. And guess what? Those different phytochemicals act in, on different pathways. So by having variety, you get the whole mix instead of just harping on a handful of them. And the other in interesting thing is there's synergy. You know what synergy is? It's the new math. You heard of new math? One plus one equals three. You know how that happens? Well, that's synergy, okay? When you have tomatoes and you have broccoli and you eat them together, the phytochemicals in one and the phytochemicals in the other don't act independently. They support each other so that the net effect is greater than the sum of the individual components. That's what synergy is all about. And the lycopene in the tomato and the isothiocyanates in the broccoli act on different pathways. You see why I mentioned that? They act on different pathways. That's why there's an enhanced protection. So, whole foods are best, right? To get your fibre, to get all your pigments, because the skin often has all the pigments, uh, many of the pigments, or majority of the pigments, but not all of them. So eating the whole food, you get the skin, the fibre, the colour. It's good, okay? And it tastes a lot better. I'm sorry, but good whole wheat bread is way ahead of this. Wonder white bread, you know, that's endosperm and starch and depleted of, I don't know if you know, but 90% of the fibre is lost 
80% of the phytochemicals are lost. It's depleted. So eating the whole food is good. So here's, here's some quick examples for you to, to ruminate on. Take a vegetable, lettuce, and one of the polyphenolics. All of these are anti-inflammatory compounds. Quercetin in onions and vegetables. In the outer leaves, you see the amount, milligrams per kilogram or parts per million. And then look what it is on the inner leaves. This is what I told you before. So don't strip the lettuce or what, cauliflower or whatever and throw away all the things that look like worms have crawled over them. <laughs> they may be the best part of the vegetable. The wheat, ferulic acid. Ferulic acid is a potent antioxidant, fairly unique in grains. And notice how high it is in whole wheat and yet in white bread, look how little it's left. Very little. Allergic acid. This is another polyphenolic in walnut and 95% of it's removed when you get rid of the skin. So the whole food is important if you want to get full maximum 10-year warranty or whatever you want to call it. Now, I just want to mention the negative side because those of us who follow a whole food plant-based diet have all these anti-inflammatory compounds but that's not the typical way that Western Europeans and Americans, Canadians and Australians eat. They eat a lot of junk food, high sugar, okay? Chips and candy and cookies and soda, you know, these are high in calories but none of these anti-inflammatory. Animal protein is nothing compared to the beans and whole grains and not eating much fruit and vegetable. Remember we said one in ten Americans eat enough? So you put all that together and the Western diet is pretty depleted of phytochemicals. Is it any wonder we have an epidemic of heart disease, cancer and diabetes and obesity? I I'm sorry, I forgot to include obesity in that list from the very beginning. But obesity is right up there and it actually it undergirds all the other chronic diseases. People who are overweight are more likely to have high blood pressure and at risk of heart attack and more likely to have cancer. 30%. Here's an example, a baked potato. Yummy. Look at how few calories it has compared with the medium French fries. And the French fries is, forget the phytochemicals. That probably is pro-inflammatory rather than anti. And then we think of dessert, a common dessert. Grandma's great apple pie served at Thanksgiving, which is coming up soon. You know, look at the calories. Almost 600 calories compared with 70 in an apple. And the apple gives you all the fiber and changes the microbiota so that you get the short chain fatty acids that act to protect you. Pro-inflammatory metabolites. So we're not saying these foods shouldn't be eaten, but we're just showing you the predominant choice should be towards whole foods. What about cooking? Does that make a difference? Yes, it can. Depends on how you cook. If you cook in water, like the Brits do with lots of water, you can bleed away a lot of them. But if you microwave or steam or stir fry, there's very little loss. That's good news. So the, what we do in the kitchen can make a big difference. Now just to summarise here, we're coming to the end, just to summarise some of the pictures. The green vegetables, this is an Italian study to show that um, different cancers that are listed at the left and the consumption of green vegetables, a medium intake versus a low intake, you see the protection you get 10, 20% generally. And when you move up to a high intake compared to the low intake, then there's a greater reduction in risk. It goes up to 60, 70%. So it 
So the arrows move to the right from low to medium to high. So what does that tell us about our need for green vegetables? We should eat more. More than what? More. Okay. How much more? More. All we know is the trend is that way. The more we eat, the more we're protected. I don't know what the upper limit is. I don't think anybody does. But, you know, there's a physical limit to how much you can eat. But certainly we need to eat more than what we've been eating. This is a Greek study. The Greek study showed that the blue and green represent vegetables and the blue and red represents fruits. And, and it's eating, what does it say there, four to five servings of vegetables the green compared to the blue which is less than two so a good robust vegetable intake versus a minimal intake and what happens to the risk of breast cancer it slips down to to a number about 55 so it's about 45 percent reduction fruit you've got to have six servings and that takes you down to about 35 so fruit are not as potent as vegetables Okay, that's the message we get here. It's an important message because it's easy to eat fruits. They're sweet. Kids don't like vegetables. Uh, Brussels sprouts, broccoli, cauliflower. You know, they have a little bit of taste. But guess what? You know what that bit of flavour is? It's the phytochemicals, the isothiocyanates that are protective. So if you try to eliminate that bitterness, you eliminate all your protection. This is another study that was um, conducted over 52 studies and they basically found that people who ate the typical Western diet had 35% increase risk of heart attack whereas those who ate more fruits and vegetables 30% lower. So this is typical of all the literature I read. Eat plant foods, the risk goes down. Eat more animal foods, the risk goes up. So you have to balance where you want to be in terms of tolerating your taste and culture and, and health needs and so on. Now, I, I've talked all, all so far about fruit and vegetable and, you'll, and, and a little bit about grains, but I, I want to show you that other foods, and just quickly, just one picture from each, legumes. Okay, legumes are also full of bioactive compounds, these polyphenolics and antioxidants that have anti-inflammatory activity. So they also protect us against elevated cholesterol and against various cancers. Whole grains, the, the nurses study in Boston done at Harvard with um, women nurses, uh, it was like 35,000 nurses that were tracked over many, many years and they found that those that more commonly ate their breads and cereals as whole grains compared to those who had refined grains. This is the protection they got. 38% lower diabetes, 33% less coronary heart disease and 43% less stroke disease. By doing what? Just making sure that they ate whole grains instead of refined. That seems like a very simple change in one's diet. And now what about nuts? Just concluding with nuts here. Walnuts, of course, are loaded with polyphenolics and omega-3. And resveratrol that we talked about earlier in grape juice, you'll see it's also in pistachios and in peanuts. And there are other um, anthocyanins and flavonoids. I won't go through the list, but it's here to impress you that Many nuts have a whole variety of different phytochemicals, antioxidants, anti-inflammatory, good protection. Beans, fruits and vegetables, whole grains and nuts, they all do the trick. And here there's the effect of eating, eating regularly nuts. It lowers your cholesterol. The line across the top is zero. The numbers going down represents suppression. So your bad cholesterol, LDL, from eating these nuts uh, and you might ask, well, which nut's the best? Well, they all go down, don't they? And if I tell you that macadamia's the best or pecan's the best and you hate that nut, the message is lost. So you look at the list and you choose which one you like 
and you promise me you'll go to Safeways and buy it, that's the one, okay? It's the one that you'll eat because they all do the good job of lowering your cholesterol. And here, this is a compilation of a number of studies that show that risk of heart disease decreases 37% when you're eating nuts four times or more a week compared to basically not eating them. Not only heart disease, but diabetes. Eating nuts, going to the left, that's, what is that, about 15% from eating nuts one to four times a week, eating them almost every day, goes up to almost 30%, and even poor old peanut butter comes in there, eating that almost regularly, decreased 20%. Uh, peanuts are legume, but legumes also behave like nuts in that they lower cholesterol, so it's, we classify it with the nuts. Okay, so in conclusion, I just want to throw in this curveball, and that is that plant-based diets are not only anti-inflammatory for you and me, but they're also anti-inflammatory to the planet. And should we be concerned about the health of our planet when we look around us and see fires and floods and calamities and what have you? Plant-based diets are much kinder to the environment. It's estimated that a, a meat-based diet requires more non-renewable energy and produces more greenhouse gases. And you'll see this um, sustainability publication um, here, the amount of resources that are required in excess for a, a meat-eating diet compared to a plant, a greater amount, almost three times more water, more fertilizer, more energy, more pesticides, and of course more greenhouse gases. And that's my last picture here, which is, shows you that eating a total plant-based diet does what? Can you see the numbers over here on the right-hand side? The number is 60% reduction. Wow! 60% reduction in greenhouse gases by doing what? switching to a plant-based diet compared to a meat-eating diet. Even cutting back from a high meat diet, 100 grams a day, that's about three and a half ounces, to a low meat-eating diet, about 50 grams or half that amount, even that cuts it back 35%. So eggs, dairy and meat are all greater at producing greenhouse gases than our corn and soya beans and oats. Okay, so when you, when you drink your oat milk or your soy milk or cashew milk or whatever, you're helping the environment because of this information. So um, just to conclude, I just show you two of my books. I'm not here to sell, but as Dr. McKenzie has mentioned, the bookstore, the ABC in College Place has these. Um, available if you're wanting more material. If any of this information interested you and you wanted to read it again, it's, it's in the book. And as she said, we will be having a book signing ceremony on or event on 28th Thursday afternoon from noon to five, something like that. So if any of you want to come stop by and ask a personal question or get your book signed, I'll be there. So... Thank you very much. It's 8 o'clock. It's Friday night, so we like to go to bed early, but I don't know if we have one or two questions. That <laughs> well, we're very grateful to Dr. Craig, and he will be doing our health nugget tomorrow right before our sermon. So if you're here at State Line Church, you'll hear that. He's going to talk on mental health, so that'll be interesting. And then at 3 o'clock, he has a talk called herbs and spice and everything nice. So I'm very interested in that. Um, herbs have a lot of healing properties, as he's been talking about with the foods. So please join us for those two sessions and have a wonderful evening. Thank you. <laughs>